praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. I want to talk to you today briefly about my walk with Christ. I think it's something that uh, should be discussed as far as believers go. I mean, somebody mentioned to me a little while back that they were speaking to some other believers who maybe were young in the faith and they didn't seem to understand that we have literally a walk that is with the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you are not alone. Once you've been born again, you're not doing this thing alone. There are times you may feel like you're alone, but it doesn't matter what the circumstance is. It doesn't matter what we think or see, or even feel. And for that matter, taste, touch, smell, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Second Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And we need to remember that. That we don't walk according to the flesh. The Bible admonishes us, for example, in Galatians 5.25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And that if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's in Galatians 5.16. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his, speaking of Christ, workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained, that we should walk in them. I mean, the Bible has a lot to say about walking. Mostly, we're supposed to walk circumspectly, the Bible tells us. We're supposed to walk and operate in faith. Walking circumspectly is found in Ephesians 5.15. Not as fools, but as the wise. But as wise. We're not supposed to be foolish in our walk. We're supposed to operate in the mind of Christ. Walk according to the Spirit. We're supposed to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's in Colossians 1.10. The Bible also says in Colossians 4.5, we need to walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 we need to walk worthy of God who has called us unto his kingdom and glory. First Thessalonians four one, furthermore we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ that as ye receive that as ye have received of us how we ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. First Thessalonians 4.12, that ye walk for them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. Second Thessalonians 3.6, now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly, and do not after the tradition which he received of us. 
And then Second Thessalonians 3.11 tells you to stay away from busy bodies who are doing the same thing. And he uses that word, walk among you disorderly. There's a whole lot in here about walking with Christ. I mean, we can keep going. Uh, I'll just throw you out a bunch more. Second Peter 2.10 tells you not to walk after the, the lust of the flesh. Second uh, Peter 3.3 3 talks about those who are scoffers in the last days, walking after their own lust. First John 1 John 1.6 says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. And just to point that out, you know, some people make that like overarching, like, oh, it's your entire life. No, I believe if you read this in context, it's really talking about in this area. So if you if you say you have fellowship with them and walk in darkness, now that would mean you can. It can also mean in one area. It doesn't have to be that. Everything that you're doing, you know, is in darkness. Like, uh, what can I say? Like a person is not saved. So there's a lot of scriptures that have a duality in meaning. It can apply to the flesh as well as the spirit. It can apply to people who are lost, but be admonishing you not to do the same. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. But don't take it that if you find yourself lacking in an area, that that means you're unsaved necessarily. It could be. I mean, I can't look into your heart. If you know you're saved, you know you're saved. You know you believe on Jesus, you're saved. I'm talking about, you know, if somebody happened on this video and you're not sure. You're just one of the religious. You're one of the five foolish virgins <laughs> that, that don't know Christ. You have no relationship with him, you know. God blesses the child that has his own. You you cannot, you cannot, mama cannot be saved for you. Daddy can't be saved for you. Grandma and grandpa can't be saved for you. You have to have your own. You have to have salvation in Christ for yourself. Nor can you be, uh, your children be saved for you. It's got to be your own. Let's see. First John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us. Cleanseth us from all sin. How come they don't never quote that when all the Lordship Damnation people? They, I, I think that one's lost to them. First John two six. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. The he there that's speaking of is the Lord Jesus Christ. We're supposed to emulate Christ. He's our example. No other living person is our example. Now, we may learn from someone. We may see someone, and I guarantee if, there, if there's something to learn from them as of concerning Christ, it's because they're emulating Christ. And so we can say, I can see the reflection of Christ in you. But it's really not that person. If they're a believer, it's really not that person. They're reflecting Christ. They're letting their light shine. And that's how you're able to see Jesus. That's how the world is able to see Jesus. You know that you've walked up on other people or had a, a, a brief, momentary, just few seconds conversation, and you will perceive that that other person is a belief. Sometimes almost instantaneously. And then you'll ask them and they'll confirm it. And vice versa. People will perceive it in you.
like take for example first John two eleven, but he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness hath blinded because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Remember what I just got through saying, in an area. A person can be a believer and be in darkness in an area. Particularly, if it, if, particularly, easy for me to say, right? If they do not yield to the power of the Holy Spirit in that area of their life. If you get off in your flesh, you're not going to be like Christ in that area. And so don't be immature in judging someone else if they are behaving not like Christ. Doesn't mean they're not saved. It means they're not acting like Christ. And if you can, if the person will hear you, admonish them kindly and sweetly in Jesus. Remind them that ain't that ain't being like Jesus right there. But don't do it in a condescending manner because there are moments that you're not like Jesus. That's why the Bible admonishes us to res if a brother or sister is overtaken in a fall, that we need to restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. And it cautions us, unless we could fall into to temptation, if we can fall into that, don't get puffed up in yourself because it's, it's of Christ. We have to walk according to the Spirit so we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh and be tempted to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Second John 1, 6, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. Whose commandments? Jesus. Jesus' commandments. Remember, he said a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. This is the commandment that, as ye have heard from the beginning, that ye should walk in it. Beloved, Christ is our example. And in your life, in your daily life, in your walk with him, just do your best as you can under the power of the Holy Spirit to emulate Christ. You can't live the Christian life under your own power. You know the people who live the Christian life under their own power? You know what they're called? The religious. Pharisees. But a person who's walking in the Spirit, they're going to use discernment, and that's the discernment of the Holy Spirit, to lead them and guide them in all truths. truth. Sometimes you may just get one word from the Holy Spirit. It, it might be like no or don't do that. I know there's three words, but basically it's a no. You're about to do something, and it'd be like tapping you on the shoulder. Uh-uh, don't do that. Don't say that. Don't go there. You don't need that. Not now. Wait a while. And it's usually the very opposite of what our flesh wants to do. That's how you know it's him. <laughs> It'll be the opposite of what your flesh. It'll be the thing you'd be like, I don't want to do it that way. That's when you know you need to really take stock and pay attention. Try the spirits. If it's not something that's ungodly and he's admonishing you to do it, then listen. And if you're getting a check in your spirit that it's something you shouldn't do and your flesh is screaming, I want to do it, then that's definitely something you need to run from. Because if the flesh wants to do it, there's a 99.9% .9 chance it ain't godly.
And it may not necessarily be something that's evil or wrong. It could just be something your flesh wants to do. Maybe you want to be, you want some glory in an area or something. It's still going to be ungodly in that regard. But what I'm saying is it may not appear at first glance to be sin or sinful. But upon deeper reflection and examination, you'll see where that could lead you to folly. Another example here would be 1 John, oh, excuse me, 3 John, chapter 1, verse 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You know, that's supposed to be our desire. If you're walking in truth, you're going to be walking in the precepts of Christ because he is the truth. What you don't want to be is Jude 118 says, people who, who mock in these last days and walk after their own, God, own ungodly lusts. Your walk with Christ is, is going to have its challenges, its ups, its downs. There'll be times you're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to feel like, oh, do I really got to go through another day? <laughs> do I really got to go through another day? Because your flesh is like, I ain't feeling this. I'm telling you I'm not feeling this, and I don't want to be Christian today. But that's the flesh talk. It's not about how we feel or, or what we think or what the circumstances look like. We have to walk according to the Spirit, and we have to walk in faith. If we want to please the Father, we have to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The Bible says anything that's not faith is sin. We need to be in agreement with Christ always. And if you find yourself ever not agreeing with Christ, understand that you're putting yourself in a bad place. You're giving Satan place. You're making an occasion for the flesh. You may be receiving and listening to the world. And their mindset, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law or word of God, neither indeed can be. I like to say the word in the New Covenant because people think of the law and they think about the commandments, but we forget about Jesus' instruction which are commandments as well. But they're not commandments that are supposed to place a burden upon you, like the ordinances of the law. It's not a whipping stick. A person who has been regenerated will be convicted if they do evil or do wrong. You'll be convicted instantly. If for any reason you shouldn't be or are not convicted, it may be because you don't know it's wrong. In some cases, the Holy Spirit will be the one to convict you where before you didn't even think that thing was wrong, and now you're getting convicted about it. Why? You're growing in grace, literally. And he's showing you, ah, that thing ain't right. And now it starts to bother you. And you get in these scriptures and start looking around and go, you know what that thing ain't doing or what's doing it? It ain't of God. Or you just get a check in your spirit that you should leave that thing alone. 
because it might be in a gray area, but it could cause a brother or sister in Christ to stumble. And so the Holy Spirit admonish you, don't, don't do that. Beloved, you should be hearing a still small voice in your walk with Christ on a daily basis. And you may not always listen to it. And don't do this thing that a lot of Christians have a tendency to do. Like, they'll say, oh, well, something told me. No, no, no. Not something. Or they'll say, well, I should have followed my first mind. No. You give credit to whom credit is due. You know, the Holy Spirit told me. And you know what? I'm talking about after the fact. When she recognized it wasn't something and it wasn't my first mind, you realize it was the Holy Spirit that was leading you and guiding you and directing you because you did what you wanted to do. Like you said to walk out the front door. Yeah, I said Finna. You were fixing to walk out of the front door. And the Holy Spirit said, you know, you ought to take that umbrella. It might rain today. You, you take that umbrella. Or he actually will say straight up, it's going to rain today. And you go, ah, I don't need it. Eh, you know, they only gave a 50% chance or a 40% chance. And then you get out there and it's, it's raining cats and dogs when you get further down the road. And you got to get out and get soaked going wherever you go. <laughs> you know, I should have followed my first mind. No. You give credit to whom credit is due, the Holy Spirit. He nudged you. Stick that umbrella. And if you don't think he did, yes, he does. He cares about the little things in your life. Yes, an umbrella. Yes, uh, uh, whether or not you should have took your hat and coat. Whatever that little instruction is, he's trying to see to it that you have peace throughout your day. But it'll also do things like when you get upset with somebody, you need to pray for that person. Right when you're angry, right when you're angry and you seeing red, the Holy Spirit will say, you need to stop and pray. And you go, I don't feel like praying right now. He ain't asking you what you felt like. <laughs> I'm telling you what you should be doing. If you have a fallout, with a family member or a friend or a coworker, and it may just be contention. It doesn't have to necessarily be some big blow up. You need to pray for that person. You need to lift them up in prayer. But you know what I've found? And you'll you'll discover this too when you start doing that if you haven't already. And you're praying for people. And you in your spirit now I'm talking about if you're praying with the evidence of speaking in tongues, you're speaking in tongues. Blasphemy. It's a biblical doctrine. I don't know why people say tongues ain't for today. You don't see where it says that anywhere in this book. <laughs> the Bible says if you ask him for the power, for the Holy Spirit, he will give you the evidence of speaking in tongues. And you can't receive a wrong spirit because Jesus covered this. When he said, if you, if you ask for the Father, you know, ask, if you ask of the Father, he can only give you good gifts. And he uses the example that if you are evil and your son asks you for bread, would you give him a stone? Or if he asks you for a fish, would you give him a serpent? He said, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more shall your heavenly Father, shall your heavenly Father give good gifts to them once? Then ask him. So you ask him, Father, I want the evidence of speaking in tongues. And then get in the book and see what the book says about tongues. Understand there's a distinction between someone who gives an utterance in church, for example, and then, then either that person will say what it meant in, in the understanding after they've uttered it in tongues, or someone else in the congregation will do it. That's how you know it was from God. He'll always give the utterance. 
and it, and that utterance in the understanding will not contradict his scripture, will not contradict his word. But that's a whole nother level. That's, that is a gift. That is a, a gift that is like um, where some people are given pastor. They're supposed to be a pastor or a prophet or evangelist or an apostle or a teacher, and that is a gift from God for them. It's the same with that type of speaking in tongues. But then there is the tongues that Paul spoke about where he said, I thank my God I pray in tongues more than you all. He wasn't talking about that particular gift as they do in a congregation with an utterance and then someone, either that same person or someone else will give what the interpretation was, what it means in the understanding. No, this is personal. Paul said, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. First Corinthians 14, 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. In 1 Corinthians 14, 2, it says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. And you need to remember that Jesus said, These signs would follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. In my name, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. In my name, they will speak what? With new tongues. That's what Pentecost was about. And one of the reasons that you see these churches don't have any power, or believers don't have any power, is they don't speak in tongues. And if you pray in your understanding... The devil can try to confound your prayer. We saw that with Daniel when Daniel prayed, and he talked about how his prayer had been, when the angel came, how Daniel's prayer had been hindered by the devil. And that the angel had to war against the devil for his prayer, to bring him his answer. But see, when we speak in an unknown tongue, we confound the devil. He don't know what we're praying about. And many times when you're praying in the Spirit, you don't know what you're praying about. I say most of the time you don't know what you're praying about. <laughs> but the Spirit gives an utterance. The Bible talks about groanings, which cannot be uttered. Romans 8.26, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we are. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So, beloved, part of your walking with Christ he wants you to be filled with the Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. For you shall receive power after which the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And people don't know how to operate. They can't operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Because they haven't received the Holy Spirit. Now, let me make a distinction here. When you get born again, the Spirit of God dwells on the inside of you. But there is the gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And sadly, many believers are afraid of that. And it's because it's been misrepresented by some idiots. 
I don't even know if they really are. They, let me say this, in the church, because they may not be in the body of Christ, which is two different things. I know the church is supposed to be the people. But when I say in church, I'm just talking about that facade that people go congregate in. Because if you're in the true church, then this is a promise that's to you, whether you understand it or not. But it's just like Jesus doesn't force himself on anyone, neither does the Holy Spirit. To as many as receive him, he gave the power to become the sons of God. But you have to receive him. It's the same thing. Jesus told him, he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. in John 2022. In Acts 1.8 it says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And for those who think that the gifts of the Spirit are not for today, or the evidence of speaking in tongues is not for today, Acts 19.2, and he said unto them, Have ye received, what, the Holy Ghost, since ye believed? Now notice that. When you're born again, you do have the Spirit of God. But there is a distinction. He said unto them, have ye received what the Holy Ghost since ye believed? You believe you're saved. You're born of God. But there is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost or be any Holy Ghost. In uh, Acts 19, verse 3, it says, And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then Paul, then said Paul, John verily, or truly, baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. That's also a way that one can receive the Holy Spirit, is to be laid hands on, by a man or woman of God, born again, spirit-filled, lay hands on you, and the Holy Ghost will come upon you, and you'll speak with tongues, and you may even prophesy. Some people be scared to death. They're scared and running in the other direction, and that's why you don't have it. You're not going to receive anything from him if, if you have a heart full of fear. And the heart is the mind, by the way. It's that thing between your ears. The Bible says that the man thinketh in his heart so easy. You don't think what that thing they told us was the heart that beating in your chest. You think what that thing is between your ears. That's the heart, according to the Bible. I'm telling you, everything... I'm not going to say everything. A lot of the things we've been taught or trained, not only in the church but in this world, are literally bath backwards. They're upside down. They're inside out. We're supposed to transform our minds by the Word of God and renew our minds on the Word of the living God. That's a part of your walk with Christ. 
So you you're saved. You're born again. You believe on Jesus. You're saved. But there is something more than just salvation. I know there's a bunch of us just preaching about how easy it is to be born again and simply believe on the finished work of Christ. And amen, that's true. But then there's something else that comes after that. Once you are saved, once your position is secure, which is you're born again, you're in Christ. You are a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But now there is... There is more. There are more gifts. There are more things to be done concerning discipleship. Not salvation. When a baby is born into this world, it didn't have to do anything. In fact, it didn't even have to be here. (laughs) Baby pops out. It's here. It is what it is. But now it has to be trained. It can't stay a baby. It's got to grow up. Come on now. And it's the same thing in Christ. Once you're born, praise God, you're in. But now, what? The rest of this time is spent learning, growing. Everything is a, is new and in, in a baby and it's exploring, it's trying everything. And this is what you need to be doing in the faith. Getting in this book, Jesus said, lay hands on the sick. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Okay, well, I need to be doing this. But get enough information. And once you're fairly sure you have it right according to the book, you're supposed to be doing it. And if you're scared, that's not of God, because the Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. In 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So you're supposed to be operating in power and love and a sound mind. Not in fear. The Bible says fear has torment. We're not supposed to be anywhere near or around fear. Fear is not from the Father. It is not of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Not at all. The Bible says if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God and give it to all men liberally and abradeth not. That's found in James 1.5. Actually, I didn't read the whole thing there. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and abrace not, and it shall be given him. So if you're not sure how to proceed, first of all, just ask the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to lead you and guide you into truth, to all truth, as he as He as promised he will do. You ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues so that you can begin to edify yourself and pray and speak mysteries to men and confound the devil. And you'll be speaking directly with God the Father. And you can make your request known to him. And that's probably one of the last things I want to talk about. There's this thing I've noticed people are doing, and I believe you're doing it incorrectly if you're doing it, according to this book. The Bible says, let your request be made known. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Now, I think it's certainly possible that if a person for any reason could not utter, maybe they're mute, right, they can't speak, or sometimes people have an illness and they have an inability to be able to utter anything, okay, that's fine, I know God understands. 
But I truly believe that if you are capable and able to open your mouth to speak, that you should utter prayer, particularly, beloved, uh, if you're going to say, hey, let's, let's pray. Well, we need, to, we need to make that known not only to the people when we're praying. I'm not talking about in the spirit now. I'm talking about in your understanding. How am I going to be in agreement with you if, if you don't pray so that I can say amen, which means so be it? I can't be in agreement if I don't know what you're praying about. And it also speaks to me that there's some level of fear there. And if you're not somebody who's good with words, you know what? It won't hurt you to write it down real quick, what it is you want to say. But the Bible tells me that you open your mouth and he'll fill it. If you don't know what to say, say, Holy Spirit, would you please give me the words to say? You'll be amazed. Because, see, now it's not even about you and you not trying to glory in your flesh and make some big pretense of a prayer. You've already submitted yourself to the Holy Spirit by asking him to fill your mouth. But just just be wise, beloved, that you need to make your requests known. If you're in a group, you need to pray so that everybody can be in agreement with that prayer. I can't be in agreement with you if I don't know what you're praying about. Prayer, like I said, with, with a few rare exceptions, is never silent. You're supposed to open your mouth and speak. Because you're also putting the devil on notice. At least you should be. And you have authority over that bastard, so there shouldn't be any problem with putting him on notice. Any, him and all his minions. Yeah, they're going to try to come against your prayer. So what? They're defeated. You just keep operating in faith and speaking and calling those things would be not as though they were. And the Heavenly Father, seeing your faith, is going to honor it and he's going to confound the devil. But you got to be saying the same thing Christ says. you got to be in agreement with Christ. And that's going to be in direct conflict with the flesh. Believe it. It may seem foolish to you in the flesh. It will definitely seem foolish to the world, but who gives a flying fig newton what they think? They on their way to hell. So be encouraged, beloved, in your walk with Christ. Your walk with Christ is going to be the exact opposite of everything that this world is in agreement with. That's why they're going to hate you. That's one of the toughest things as a believer when you strike out on this thing. In your walk with Christ is that you're not going to be like going around, or you shouldn't be going around trying to uh, magnify any disagreements or anything like that. But, if somebody is contradicting what this word says about you, what the promises of Jesus are to you, I don't care if it's a family member. I don't care if they're a believer. Politely let them know, I'm sorry, but uh, that's not an agreement with Christ, and I have to reject that. If you think it's going to cause some big super conflict, then you can quietly not say anything. In your mind, say, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. And when you, as soon as you can get out of their presence, say it. And curse that. You know, there is such a thing as biblical cursing. Not the person. I'm talking about the statement. Curse what they said in the name of Jesus and cast it down. The Bible says to cast down any vain imagination or anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That means an agreement with Christ.
The provisions he's made for you are yours for the asking. And in many cases where he's already made the provision, in other words, you're not waiting on something, is yours for the taking. It's yours to utilize. Sadly, too many believers have gifts sitting there and things, unwrapped gifts, unwrapped blessings, just sitting there, going, going to seed, because they're not using it. But the good news is, any moment that you awaken to the fact that it's there and it's for you to have, to use, to be blessed by, to be a blessing with, if you step out in faith, you can begin to operate in it. But that's going to take some exercising on your part. Just like when we exercise in the flesh, you've got to use muscles to do that. Well, you've got to use your spiritual muscles. And if the moment a voice says, well, I don't think you can do that, and I don't think you should do that, and that's the devil. Because the gifts of God, the gifts from the Father, are yea and amen. Yes, and so be it. Be blessed, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Amen.